I want to welcome everybody here today as we gather in the first month of April. Spring is supposed to be upon us. It's a little, a little chilly, but uh, we're, we're getting there. It's good to have all of the visitors with us. We're glad that you're here. We're thankful that we have this opportunity, both our visitors and our members, to be together to worship our God and to study more about his word. Today is, once again, uh, that day we call Easter. For all of us, it has a secular, uh, important secular connotation, secular holiday. But for many all across the world today, uh, this is a very religious, highly important day uh, for, quote-unquote, the Christian church or for for Christianity. When you consider the religious connotation of Easter and how important it is for us to realize and understand not only for ourselves but for those whom we talk to, what the Bible says about the concept of Easter and about Jesus and about his resurrection. Because there will be people tomorrow at work or at school, uh, when we talk to people, some are going to wonder, did you guys have a Easter play? Did you have a, an Easter like a, some churches did the whole Friday, Saturday, Sunday, different activities, different things going on to represent the trial and death and resurrection of Jesus. What are we gonna, how are we going to respond? What are we going to say? So let's consider what the facts are regarding Christ and his, his, all the events surrounding his resurrection and what all happened. Because when we consider what took place, and then we combine it with what we learned in the New Testament about the example of the saints after the church has been established, we will learn quite a bit with how, uh, regarding how the saints saw this holiday. Consider with me in John chapter 19 and in verse 14, John chapter 19 and in verse 14, as Jesus has been brought before Pilate to be tried, John tells us, Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, this is Pilate, behold your king. And in verse 15, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. As, and of course, later on, we see how the, the, the... the chief priests and the elders, they urge the people to uh, shout, crucify him, crucify him. They won't even, uh, when it comes time for Pilate to say, you know, we have a, a tradition of releasing uh, one of our prisoners on this day and shall release this, this riot, riotous murderer to you or Jesus. And they say, release the, the riotous murderer. Uh, that's how much they disliked Jesus. But what we find is that what we call the uh, this, this week leading up to Christ's death, uh, six days before this, he has been to Bethany. Now he's coming to Jerusalem. Days before he was welcomed into Jerusalem uh, as king of kings, they were laying down palm fronds in his path as he was coming in on a donkey. And now we see them yelling, crucify, crucify. So we know that this is on a Friday. This is before the Passover Sabbath. This Sabbath is a, what they called the High Sabbath. This was, oh, if, if there was such a thing as a holier Sabbath than all the rest of them, this was it because of the culmination of Sabbath, which in of itself was holy. But you also had Passover, which also instituted the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the, the week in which they observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so here in verse 31 of John chapter 19, we read, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies, this is after Jesus has been on the cross and he has died, although they don't know that, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And of course, when they get to Jesus, they realize that he's already, he's already died. And so there's this consistent recognition throughout the Gospels, but here in John chapter 19, it's convenient because it's all right here in the same chapter, to show that Jesus, his trial as he was betrayed on Thursday night, he's brought before Pilate Friday morning, he is condemned and crucified on Friday. And before it gets to 6 p.m., that was the beginning of the Sabbath. Remember the Jews, their their day was from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. 
And so before it got to 6 p.m., Jesus had to, all those had to come down off the cross because the Jews couldn't, couldn't deal with anything of the dead on the Sabbath. They were purified, had to purify themselves, for not only for Sabbath, for, for Passover. And so we see that Jesus dying on the Friday before Passover, we see in John chapter 19 going to verse 42, after Jesus has been taken down off the cross, where they, uh, verse 42, there was a tomb nearby, there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby, it wasn't going to take long to put him in there, uh, and it wouldn't infringe upon the turning over onto the day of Sabbath. And so we see Jesus in verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse 1 of John, now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So after Jesus was laid there on Friday, of course we have the Sabbath day, and then it says the first day of the week, that's Sunday. So Jesus has been in, been in the ground. He's been buried for Friday, Saturday, now Sunday. Now she comes here on the first day of the week. She's there to... Uh, get into the tomb to be able to, to do the uh, different things that needed to be done for the body and the preparation of the burial. And as she comes, she realizes that the tomb, the tomb is rolled away. And through the process of John chapter 20, they discovered that Jesus was raised. This is the Sunday after Passover, and it just happened to also be the day of first fruits. And we'll notice that here in just a moment. And then in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 1, Acts chapter 1 and in verse 1, picking up with after Jesus was raised, we find that after this fact, the former account I made, Luke, as he's writing to Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus, after he was raised, starting with Sunday, he lived on this earth. I mean, he was, he was flesh and blood. He, he, was, he was alive. He was raised. He was 40 days teaching about the kingdom of God. He was helping the apostles to understand what was going to be required of them for 40 days. He's teaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And then he ascended after verse, uh, we see in verse 4, uh, going through that account. After Jesus had given them the uh, instructions to stay in Jerusalem and about the Holy Spirit, he ascends up into heaven in a cloud. So, we put all of this together and we see that Jesus and this... This process of time that takes place, it wasn't just a one-day or two-day thing. In fact, even going further into Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, here comes Pentecost. The day of Pentecost had fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place. And as we go through this, we find that this is the church being established. All of these are connected together. Fifty days after the Passover, you have Pentecost, Ten days after Jesus ascended, it was on a Sunday that the church was established, and it was the Feast of first fruits. Consider with me Leviticus chapter 23 and in verse 9. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 9, where uh, God commands Moses to talk to the children of Israel regarding how all of this is supposed to work, these holy feasts that they are to observe. He says, starting in verse 10, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you to reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. That fell on this day after the Sabbath that Jesus was raised. This waving of the first fruits, the thanking God for the harvest, for all the, the blessings that God had given them. That's why often Christ is referred to as the first fruit, but it's related spiritually because he was the first to rise never to die again. And now our thanks isn't just for the harvest, but now our thanks is because we have the hope of eternal life, because Christ has been raised. Then going into verse 12, you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheath a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Verse 15, you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven sh Sabbaths shall be completed. 
seven Sabbaths, that's seven weeks, with seven Sabbaths, seven times seven is 49. 49 days after. So then we have, verse 16, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. This is the Feast of first fruits. And this is what this represented for the children of Israel as they uh, had this uh, given to them through Moses and passed on down through the generations. That's why this was so important to recognize that Pentecost, pente meaning 50, Pentecost was the representation of that day upon which verse 16 took place. You shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. When we consider all of this, Jesus was raised on a Sunday, the church being established 50 days after, after seven Sabbaths, the day after that Sunday, the church was established on a Sunday. All of this is important to describe because when we get to the point that we start talking about Easter, people think that Easter comes from all these accounts, from John chapter 19 and from John chapter 20. But nowhere in there did we read about Easter. In fact, the term Easter doesn't come from the Bible at all. I don't know if you can read this. It's a little small. It, it's pronounced a lot of different ways. But Istra is the Germanic goddess of spring. You think about renewal. You think about birth. You think about rabbits and eggs and all that. That's where it comes from. The timing of the Christian festival of Easter, which is an older pagan festival appropriated by the Catholic Church, is still dictated by the moon, which is interesting because last year, I'm going to say uh, it was April 20th, I think, was uh, uh, Easter last year. And this year, it's April 1st. It's been a while, so it's been that early. The root of the term means to shine. And that's where we get the term east from. The sun rises in the east, and that's why we call it east, because that's what the term means, to shine. And so when we talk about the idea of, of the secular ob observation of Easter with the egg hunts and all that, well, that's a pagan thing. Well, then we shouldn't call that direction east, or whichever direction it is, east, because that comes from that same thing. So when we think about the term Easter, well, why is it in Acts chapter 12 and in verse 4, in the King James Version, does it say, starting in verse 3 of Acts chapter 12, oh, yeah, for Acts, uh, starting in verse 3, this is as Herod has taken James, he's beheaded James, and now he's taken Peter prisoner, and he intends to do the same thing to Peter. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also, and it was the days during the, the, it was during the days of unleavened bread. Same period of time. Okay, this is before Passover. The days of unleavened bread. Verse 4, so when he had arrested him, talking about uh, Herod arresting Peter, he put him in prison, delivered him to the four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Easter. That's what the King James Version has. Interestingly, that, ver that term is not in the New King James Version. But going to the root of the term, the term itself is Pascha. Pascha. The term means Passover. It is used 27 times in the New Testament. 26 out of the 27 times, it's not translated Easter, it's translated Passover because that's what it means. This is the only time in the King James Version, and not in the New King James, and it shouldn't be at all, is the term Easter ever found. And really what it should read is, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. This is not a separate term. The term Easter has been inserted into the religious consciousness by those who are going based off of tradition, going based off on trying to, to garner more people's attention, not based off of what the Bible says. Easter isn't from the Bible at all. So then what does that mean for people? What does that mean for my friends and for my family and for people who really do put religious stock into this concept of Easter? You take a look at the facts. Take a look at the accounts of Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And you think about the fact that nowhere is the idea of Easter mentioned. It's interesting to me that 
The two main times, if people don't go to church, a lot of times Christmas and Easter are the two times they go. For us today in the religious community, those would kind of be like the, the high Sabbaths for people today. But what's interesting is that those two dates, they, well, you think about the supposed Christmas, it, Jesus really wasn't, doesn't sound like he was born in December at all. But regardless, that's when they want to celebrate it. So they focus on his birth and his death. But everything in between, for some reason, that isn't that, it's not that important for people to learn about. They focus on his birth. Oh, Lord, we love the, the fact that you sent your son. You focus on his death and his resurrection. Oh, Lord, we, we're so thankful that he was willing to die for us. But all the substance in between, that's left out. In John chapter 6 and in verse 61, after Jesus has said, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood if you wish to inherit eternal life. Many of his disciples couldn't handle that saying. It was too hard a saying for them. They didn't understand exactly what he was talking about. So in verse 61, Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this. And he said to them, does this offend you? What if when you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. This is confirmed when Jesus says in the passage that Rodney read in Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father. Lord, Lord, we celebrated your son's birth. Lord, Lord, we celebrated your death, your burial, and resurrection every year. I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Where is it commanded in the Gospels that that take place? It's not. We read verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. This is why Jesus uses this parable regarding this wise man who built his house on a rock. So that when the storm came and the waves beat against that house, it was firm. It had a foundation that was solid. Why? Because he based everything he did on the teachings of Jesus. Instead, a lot of people just want to focus on the start of it and the end of it. And not everything in between. In addition to this, though, when we look at the example in Acts, where we see a glimpse into the life in the early church, we find no example of the saints observing anything special. During the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, nothing special. No special recognition after the church was established. Nothing Easter related at all. In fact, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 6, we know in verse 7, we use that, that verse to describe how that this was the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. This was a regular occasion when the saints gathered to break bread, to take the Lord's Supper. Well, previously to that, Paul and those journeying with him, his companions, in verse 6, Luke says, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Which is to say, guess what? Paul spent Easter in Philippi. After the days of unleavened bread, that, was, that culminated at Passover. Well, that's, that's Easter. The day after, anyway, is Easter. And yet, they stayed in Philippi, now they've come to Troas. We go to verse 16, after they leave Troas, Paul, he decides to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. It's interesting to me that Paul, being as, as religious-minded, as spiritually-minded as he was, why didn't he want to be in Jerusalem for Easter? I mean, of all the holy days to be in Jerusalem, Easter should be the day he should want to be there. I mean, what a big whoop de doo They must be making the saints in Jerusalem uh, on Easter. But notice, none of these terms, all these terms relate back to the Jewish recognition of their feasts because that's what the Israel, uh, nation of Israel was doing. There was no recognition for the Christians of anything special about these days anymore. The days of unleavened bread. Notice Luke doesn't say anything about after the days of Easter. Days of unleavened bread. 
He wanted to be back for the day of Pentecost. Because there are no high holidays for the Christian. It's important to be able to show that, to explain that simply and reasonably with people. Where do we get the basis upon which we have these plays depicting Jesus being crucified and then resurrecting? We get it from man, not from God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 23, in fact, our, our bulletin article this morning is talking about the Lord's Supper. And what is the Lord's Supper? And what better opportunity to talk to our friends and neighbors when they ask about what we did for Easter? Well, here's what I did for the Lord's Day. I took the Lord's Supper. And I do that every Sunday. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Notice, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Not some play depicting Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Not some manger scene that isn't accurate anyway. Not some special recognition on, in December 25th and on April whatever it is that happens to be Easter that day, that year. Do this in remembrance of me, he says. When? On the first day of the week. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Every week we remember our Lord and Savior through the act of taking the Lord's Supper. Verse 27, therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. Not just once a year or twice a year. Every, really every day, but every week. Taking a look at why I'm taking the Lord's Supper. Am I taking it in a worthy manner? Am I taking it with sin in my life? Because he who eats and drinks, uh, verse 27, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This isn't some rite or ritual that we have to do every week. We should look at this as the means of an opportunity to remember our Lord and Savior that we have the privilege to do every week. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every Sunday and only on Sunday. Think about how important Sunday was. Remember all those things we looked at? The fact that he was raised on Sunday, the church was established on a Sunday. Sunday is an important date in Christianity. Not Easter, not December 25th, the first day of the week. We need to remember Jesus' birth, sure. His death, yeah. His resurrection, absolutely. But we also need to remember his life and his ascension every day, not just twice a year. And I hope it's not just happening once a week either when we're taking the Lord's Supper. Because if that's the case, then generally we're only living as Christians on that one day a week. Remembering His birth, His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, you take out any one of those and we don't have any hope at all. But our religious society wants to focus on just two of them as if those are the most important. And they're not. Was the fact that he was born important? Sure. But you know what? If he hadn't lived a faithful, holy, sinless life, you and I have no hope. The fact that his death, the fact that he died for me and that he was resurrected, is that important? Sure. But if he hadn't ascended into heaven, we would not have a high priest to, that mediates for us. 
that intercedes on our behalf. He wouldn't be set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to help our friends and our neighbors understand, and for ourselves, remember that this is not Easter from a religious perspective. This is the Lord's Day. This is the first day of the week. This is the day we gather to take the Lord's Supper. The bread, which is the body that was beaten, that was scourged, that was crucified, nailed to a tree. The blood that came forth from His wounds. That precious blood that purchased the church. That sanctified the new covenant that cleanses us from our sin. We need to remember that when we partake knowing that He died for you and for me, but also for all those who think they're serving God. Lord, Lord, look at all the plays and all the things we did for you to remember your son's birth and his death, in addition to all the other things people want to do in the name of Christ. But did Christ command it to be done? That's what it boils down to. You who practice lawlessness, you didn't do that which I told you to do. And one thing that's emphasized over and over again in the Gospel of John is the fact that Jesus' words, they are life. We have to listen to what He says and do them. That's the lesson for you this morning. Hope it's something that's been beneficial not just for ourselves, but for people we come into contact with, people that we're going to talk to tomorrow and this week, asking us, what did your church do for Easter? Well, we took the Lord's Supper. Just like we do every week. Well, what's the Lord's Supper? Why do you do it every week? There's a bulletin out there. You can read that and you can tell them exactly what the Lord's Supper is all about. The means by which we fulfill the commandment of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of me. We offer an invitation this morning to those who are not Christians to be baptized to since washed away. To be part of the body that Jesus died to purchase. Part of the body that resides in the kingdom of God. Submitting to His rule, His authority, faithfully obedient to Him. Those of us who are Christians, let's make sure that we're not just we talk, talk about living the way that we should, especially now as we're about to partake the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat, and so let him drink. We need to make sure we're in a right state with God. Because if we are taking in an unworthy manner, whether it's our attitude, our mindset, whether our thoughts are elsewhere or there's sin in our life, it's an unworthy manner. We drink and eat condemnation to ourselves. That's the lesson. If you're subject, please come forward as we stand and sing.